Born in Mount Pleasant, it's good to be with you uh, here this Sunday morning. Uh, we are certainly looking forward to uh, when we can get back in uh, to the sanctuary. And as, as you know, uh, or as I, I hope you know at this point, um, we will be transitioning back in uh, this week uh, on July 15th into the sanctuary uh, for our Wednesday night uh, prayer meetings. And we'll continue that for the following uh, two Wednesdays. So for the rest of July, we will be meeting um, only on Wednesday nights inside of the sanctuary. We'll continue to meet outside or online for uh, the Sunday morning service. And hopefully uh, the tentative date for our moving back into the sanctuary on Sunday mornings uh, is going to be August 2nd. So uh, certainly looking forward to that. And, and as we as we begin to think about this, as we uh, enter into this transition of getting back into the sanctuary, uh, I've been thinking back on uh, this time quite a bit, uh, and also looking looking forward uh, to moving back in. Uh, there's a lot of planning going on, a lot of practical matters that, that's got to be taken care of, got to be thought through. Uh, but in the midst of all that, I've also been thinking, and I'm sure you have as well, uh, of the spiritual and, and theological matters concerning uh, our time apart, and, and now that we're uh, the, the matters of the theological matters of, of coming back uh, together. Um, one of the major drawbacks, and I, I know you've, you've experienced this as well, one of the major drawbacks of not being able to be together, uh, I mean, obviously we are um, uh, in, in the Sunday morning service in the parking lot, but it's still not the same. It's not uh, being able to be together. Uh, in the way that we typically think of it. Uh, but one of the major drawbacks of that is this tendency of us to turn inward. Uh, and this is not just in the midst of a pandemic. This can happen uh, anytime when we, when we uh, do not meet together, when maybe we turn uh, away from a local church or whatever it may be. We have the tendency of focusing on ourselves, the tendency of seeing the world through our own uh, lens the tendency of, of making ourselves the judge and measure of all things, uh, and really the tendency to get in our own heads uh, too much uh, without having really a, a, an outlet to express what we're feeling or thinking. In other words, we begin to see the world through our own perspective, uh, in our own perspective alone. Uh, it's very easy to, to do when you are uh, by yourself. Uh, and the good thing about being a part of a church, especially a part of, of a local church, is that we don't have to be alone. Uh, in fact, when we look at, um, at the model that we see in the early church in the book of Acts, uh, Christians were never intended to be alone uh, in this life. As, as many were added to the church uh, in Acts, Luke's, Luke records in, in 2, 46-47, and they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. In other words, they were, they were living life together. They were praying together. They were worshiping together, uh, giving together, breaking bread uh, together, learning the apostles' uh, teachings and, and doctrine together. All of this being together allowed them to turn their focus not inward but outward toward one another and toward uh, God. In other words, they saw life from a different perspective, ultimately from a godly perspective, from God's own perspective. Uh, it's clear not only from this passage concerning the early church, but, but from our own experience as well that, that we were made, we are made for fellowship. Fellowship keeps us grounded. It keeps us in check. Uh, it gives us an outlet uh, to, to, to talk to one another, to learn from one another, to help one another, to grow uh, with one another. And it shows us, ultimately, that we desperately need one another. Uh, the psalm we will look at this morning, I think, emphasizes uh, this point well. Uh, in, in the third book of the Psalter, we find psalms written by three different uh, music directors, uh, if you will. Uh, these men then would, would be in charge of supervising uh, the music of the worship service in the sanctuary. Uh, 
And one of those music directors, Asaph, is said to have written 12 psalms in, in total, uh, 11 of which we find in this third book uh, of the psalms, of the Psalter. And we're going to look at one of those uh, psalms of Asaph this morning, Psalm uh, 73. In it, Asaph writes about uh, these struggles that he's having, these, these doubts uh, that come uh, from him looking at the world through his own perspective. Uh, it begins in this sort of individual uh, focus, this individual uh, emphasis. But once he comes together, we're going to see with other believers uh, into the sanctuary for worship, to, to meet God, uh, his perspective shifts and he, he begins to rightly see the world through God's lenses. Uh, and with this new perspective, he begins to see clearly who God is, uh, namely that he is good. Uh, moreover, he begins to see the world for how it truly is, namely under God's control, whether it looks like it or not. And finally, he begins to understand how he and the community of believers are to live uh, in light of these truths. Ultimately, Asaf learns that believers need one another to keep their focus on God and to build up his kingdom. That is, this is Asaf's main point, that, that believers need one another to keep their focus on God and to build up his kingdom. And, and we see uh, his, his progression uh, of thought, his thought process. It works in three different stages, and that's how we're going to look at it. That's how we're going to approach this psalm uh, this morning. We'll first look at Asaph's worldview from his own perspective, so man's perspective, and we see that in verses 1 through 14. So follow along, and we'll stop in 14, uh, 1 through 14, Psalm 73. Asaph writes this, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious of the foolish. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more uh, than heart. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are, are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend the generations of thy children. We went into verse 15. Uh, that's sort of going to be the transition point. I, th I think you can feel that as we, as we transition there. We're not going to be there yet. We need to look at verses 1 through 14. Uh, right before we get to that transition where he focuses uh, his, his emphasis, his, his, his perspective uh, on God. But Asaph begins here in verses 1 through 14 uh, with, this, with this creed, a, a declaration of faith, or, or so it seems. He proclaims this, this wonderful statement. He says, truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. And this sounds like a really good statement. Uh, for We know it to be true as we look back on, on biblical history. And, and Asaph himself certainly knows this to be true. But, but as we see, as we, as we come to verse 2, uh, what Asaph says here is almost said in sarcasm. Uh, it's, it's like that movie, it's almost like that, that scene from the movie Airplane when the main character is right, he's, he's asked to land the plane after the pilot's. Uh, become ill, and the doctor asks this man, he says, can you land the plane? And, and the man says, uh, surely you, you can't be serious. And uh, that man responds, uh, you know, I am, then don't call me Shirley. Uh, we, we all know this scene if we watched uh, the movie, but what this man says when he says, surely you can't be serious, he, he's implying that there's, there's no way that he can actually 
uh, land of this plain. And, and this is almost what Asaph is saying here. He says, truly, truly, surely you, you are good to Israel and, and those that are of a clean heart. But as I look at the world around me, it appears that this actually isn't true. Uh, and so as Asaph begins to see the world from his own perspective, as he as he has this sort of inward uh, focus, he begins to doubt that God is actually good to his people. Why? It was because of what he sees in the world. He sees a world around him where the wicked uh, are prospering, where they have no pain or hardships uh, uh, until death, where, where they have strength, they have no troubles, uh, they wear their pride proudly, uh, they're not punished for violence, they have all that they could ever need or, or wish for, they do not reap what they sow, that of corruption and oppression. In fact, they even mock the heavens. And we see in verse 10, it goes so far as to say that even, even sometimes they, they, they draw God's people uh, to them away from God. And, and God's people will say, well, how will, even, how will God even know uh, that, that we have turned away? In short, what, what Asaf is seeing here is the ungodly prosper. He's seeing them increase in riches, all without suffering any consequences uh, for their actions. We, we know this to be true. We, we see this in our own life, uh, right, where uh, oftentimes we try to do good, we try to live godly lives, but it seems like the wicked are the ones that prosper. The wicked are the ones that, that uh, are built up uh, in this life. Maybe you do everything right in your job, uh, whereas other people, uh, you know, take the wrong road or other people uh, may do shady things and they end up maybe getting the promotion over you. We see the wicked prospering. Maybe uh, for, for the younger uh, people, you don't cheat on the test. You do poorly, uh, but those that cheat actually do really well. So we see this all the time, this idea of, of the ungodly uh, prospering. Uh, and this leads him, to, us off, to just throw his hands up. It's something we do oftentimes when we see uh, this sort of incongruity uh, in how we think the world should work. He throws his hands up and, and just asks, is it even worth it? He says, I've cleansed my heart and I've washed my hands in innocency and I've done all this in vain. In other words, my integrity, my purity, my faith in God are all pointless, or so it seems. You know, I get nothing from it, a soft feels. In fact, the only thing I get is, is plagues and chastisement daily. I get what the wicked deserve, so what's the point? Why, why should I try uh, to do the right thing when the ones that do the wrong things are the ones that prosper? Now, what Asaf is basically doing here is, is throwing himself a pity party, and, and, and Asaf is the only one invited. Uh, he, he's envious of the wicked. He's, he's cynical of the world uh, around him. His focus is turned away from God and, and away from his goodness toward himself and, and all of his problems. And, and this is not to say that Asaph is a bad person. This is not to, to disregard the fact that he has real questions and, and real doubts. I, you know, I think we all uh, struggle with this at some point or another. We all have doubts. We all have uh, questions. I think we need to understand what, what this means. Uh, Michael Wilcock, I think, is helpful when he writes this. He says, It's not that Asaph's faith is slipping into unbelief. Rather, as, as Clements states, doubt is something only a believer can experience. For you can only doubt what you believe. Doubt is to unbelief what temptation is to sin. A test, but not yet a surrender. Therefore, what we see Asaph going through here is not his faith slipping, uh, rather it's his, his confidence slipping, his assurance slipping, his peace of mind uh, slipping. And we see this clearly in verses 2 uh, through 3. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, gone, my steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Uh, we see this inward focus again in verse 13. I've cleansed my heart, washed my hands uh, in vain. So what we have here is a man who, who looks at the world from his own perspective. He, he sees the plight of 
the righteous and the plight of the wicked. The wicked are prospering. The righteous aren't, including himself. He's seeing the world through his own perspective. God is there, certainly, but is he really good? Is he for his people? Again, we can put ourselves into Asaph's or Asaph's shoes here. But what we have is a shift in verse 15. And we've already read that shift. And we're going to look at verses uh, 15 uh, through 20 here. We can put ourselves in the Asaph's shoes. And then we can move on to this shift. And we see it in verse 15. And this is the, this is the second stage of Asaph's thought process. So we see this inward focus, and then we get to verse 15, where, where his mind changes. If I say I will speak thus, if, he, if he's going to proclaim all that he's just said to the people, what happens? He says, Behold, if I speak thus, if I speak this, what I've just said, I should offend. If I speak it publicly, I should offend against the generation of thy children, or offend against the family of of God. So up until this point, the entire focus of the psalm has been on Asaph himself. Uh, he, he mentions God, he mentions the nation of Israel, he mentions the wicked, but his whole thought process revolves around himself and the troubles that he is in and the way in which he perceives the world. But in verse 15, someone else comes into view. He states this, it is, it is it, you know, if I say all of these things in public, I'm going to offend my family, namely the children of God. I'm going to offend my brothers and sisters. If I voiced what I'm feeling privately without having sat down and really thought through this with my brothers and sisters and, and before God, he says, I would, I would become a major letdown to my people. I would, I would become a stumbling block to my brothers and sisters. And, and it's not that... Asaph is, or, or us either, it's not that we should suppress our feelings or our thoughts or our doubts. We should certainly air them out with, with God and with his people. That's important for our growth. But he understands the, the importance of not being quick to speak, right? And instead, he needs to first be with God and with God's people before he throws in the towel, before he just gives up. He needs to try this first. He needs to gather with the people before God first. And, and, and as his mind shifts from this self-interest and self-pity to the family of God, of which he is a part of with his brothers and sisters, he is, as Kidner writes, introduced to a forgotten factor, a relationship which is a wealth of quite another kind. It's in this moment that he, he understands that, that the doubt which he has been trying to overcome, the questions uh, he has been asking, will not be answered, and this will not be overcome by working through it on his own. He says in verse 16, When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. But listen to what he says. Verse 15, and then we move into verse 16 through 20. When I thought to know this, it was too painful to, for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest, cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors, as a dream when one awaketh. So, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. So, this this. The shift of perspective, the shift of thought occurs as he as he comes together with the family of God, right? As, as, he, as he focuses on these people that he has been entrusted to lead and worship, as he thinks about this family, he understands that he doesn't have to work through these doubts and these problems and uh, these frustrations uh, alone. Uh, this, this thought leads Asaph into the sanctuary of God, where he says, until I went in there, in the sanctuary of God, to meet with God, I, I, I didn't have understanding, but when I did, I understood. I understood. I got a correct perspective. In other words, by myself, Asaph says, I, I was foggy, I was incoherent, I, I was misguided. But once I entered into the sanctuary of God with the family of God, I finally had clarity. 
to understand how this happens, it's it's important for us to understand uh, what the sanctuary or the temple of God is, what it what it represents. Basically, the the temple or sanctuary is the place where where God calls his his people to to meet both with him and with one another as the family of God. It, it's much like what we think of. Uh, when we think of our meeting together today. In, in both contexts, the family of God meets in the, sh- the sanctuary, as Michael Wilcock writes, to hear his word and to respond in praise and prayer and self-offering. In that God-centered fellowship, each is at the service of the rest, and each is attentive and obedient to what God says to all. He continues on, he says, The church today, like the temple in former days, should provide such a fellowship. And there, the things that puzzle and confuse begin to fall into place, even if we do not get the kind of answers we are looking for. We see this necessity of, of meeting together. We see it from the writer of Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, where he stresses the necessity uh, of us coming together in, in order to stir up one another to love and good works, to encourage one another. We all know the well-known proverb that, that speaks to this, Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen, that iron sharp, sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. Paul hits on this same idea, the same theme concern, concerning our mutual uh, gathering when he writes in Colossians three sixteen this, let the word of Christ dwell within you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. It's clear that our meeting to God, meeting together in God's presence is an invaluable aspect of what it means to be in the family of God. Moreover, it is invaluable to our growth and our sanctification. It turns our attention away from ourselves towards others, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, and most importantly, uh, our God. And when Asaph then gets this correct perspective, this godly perspective, he begins to understand that his perspective was a limited one. He he understands that although the wicked may prosper in this life, they will ultimately be brought down to destruction. Ultimately, they will they will hear hear the words of of Jesus in Matthew seven twenty three, uh, "Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you." Right. So, so he gets a correct perspective, and his mind shifts. It shifts away from, well, the wicked are prospering, and I'm suffering. That, that, that now, that, that present focus on what he sees is then shifted to what he knows to be true, uh, even now, but, but certainly in the future, the destruction of the wicked, and, and ultimately the prospering of the righteous. But notice... As we transition into this final stage of the soft thought process, the future end of the wicked is not the only thing that he recognizes. Again, with this newfound godly perspective, he understands the folly of his self-interest, his envy, his doubting. But thankfully, he equally understands uh, the grace of God in his life, even in the midst of his doubts. Questions and we see this in verses 21 through 28. And they say this Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand, and thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart fails. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. So as his perspective shifts, Asaph, along with understanding the end of the wicked, now recognizes the ignorance of his former thoughts, his former perspective. He writes that to us in verses 21 through 22 that he was uh, he has been pricked uh, to his reins. He is, his heart is grieved because he was foolish and ignorant. Uh, but even in his and even in our most foolish and ignorant moments, we can equally proclaim with Asaph, nevertheless, I am continually with thee. You, God, has, has, have, have held me by your right hand. 
you, you guide me with your counsel, and you will one day receive me to glory. So with this new perspective, Asaph can now see God for who he is, especially uh, in the context of his own life, past, present, and future. Kidner writes it like this, God has grasped, he does guide, and he will glorify his servant. This is the same sequence that we see uh, Paul write about in Romans 8, 29 through 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestine, them he also called, and whom he called, them also he justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So what Asaph begins to understand, and much like what we see in, in Paul's thought process there in the Romans passage, is that God is actually good. And his goodness revealed in, in, in many different ways is exemplified in his work for us in eternity past, in the present, and in eternity future. Asaph, along with all believers then, uh, can be assured uh, of that question that he, he first poses, or that, that not question, but the creed that he posed in verse 1, truly God is good, uh, to Israel and to those that are clean of heart. Asaph now understands this to be true. There's no sarcasm in that anymore. Along with believers, we can, we can rest assured in this as well, that God is for his people. And upon understanding this, we can now rest in that salvation. Asaph writes, Whom have I have in heaven but thee, and there is none upon the earth that I desire but thee. So he's come a long way, right, from verse 1. In the beginning, God was only good if Asaph was prospering, but now he can humbly say, My flesh and my heart fails, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And that leads us ultimately to this conclusion that he has in verses 27 through 28. Ultimately, they that are far from thee will perish. You've already destroyed them that go whoring from thee. But as for me, as, as for me, as a child of God, it is good for me to draw near to you, he says, to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Where in the beginning, Asaph was pulling away from God and doubting. In the end, now, with this correct perspective, he is drawing near to God and, and trusting and the change came through his meeting with his family, his godly family, meeting with his brothers and sisters in the very presence of the Lord. It took a perspective change. And his perspective changed not by himself, but with the help of his brothers and sisters. Again, the point remains, we need one another. We need one another to, to, to see God clearly uh, for who he is for what he has done, for what he is continuing to do, and what he promises to do. We need one another. But notice that, that this help, this refocused perspective towards God is not only for ourselves. It's not only to help Asaph here. Certainly Asaph uh, can now grow in a way that he, he wasn't growing at the beginning of the psalm. But look at the final verse. He's drawing near to God and he's trusting in him in order to go out and proclaim his goodness and salvation to others. Kathleen Nielsen is helpful, I think, when she writes this. Scripture repeatedly calls us to see a bigger picture. A picture of a God who is in the process of drawing generations of people to himself through the Son. The center of the story is that Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the kingdom of people he is building for his own glory. She continues on and says, Asaph's words can make us yearn to see God rightly in the midst of our struggles, not just for our own well-being, but ultimately for God's glory, which means the prospering of God's kingdom. And we are all responsible not to betray the generation of God's children, in fact, to tell rightly of all God's works so that God's family will grow and prosper. I think Nielsen is, is absolutely right here. The psalm speaks to our lives personally, but it is to move us toward a place of blessing others, primarily through the proclamation of God's work for us in Christ Jesus.
you may ask, you say that, but, but where is Christ in this psalm? How does this psalm fit in with the rest of Scripture? How, 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 does, it, how does it fit in with this narrative, uh, this growing narrative in the Bible as a whole? So let's look briefly at that, and that's where we'll close. If you notice, this psalm, Psalm 73, it falls in the middle of the Psalter, in the middle of all the psalms. And so the Psalter as a whole, uh, it begins by telling us that we will be blessed due to our obedience, right? We look at Psalm 1, blessed are those who walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, uh, but meditate on the law of the Lord. That's a brief summation. So we will be blessed due to our obedience. However, as the Psalms progress, as we've been progressing through them in our Wednesday night uh, meetings, we see that obedience uh, does not always lead to prosperity. We looked at the same thing uh, in the book of Job. Uh, Job's obedience, his righteousness, did not lead uh, to his prospering. In, in fact, he lost everything. Uh, and this is something that, that Asaf has learned as well. He, he, write, write, he says, I've cleansed myself, I have a pure heart in vain. Uh, but as the Psalms move towards their end, much like Asaf, as, as, as we begin to understand that in spite of life, uh, not working out as it ought to, God is still in control and he is good. This is why both Asaf and the Psalter as a whole end in praise. Psalm 150 uh, verse 6 ends, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Pray ye the Lord. So the, the Psalter begins uh, much like Psalm 73 begins. This idea that if we obey, we will, be, we will prosper. We will be blessed. But as Asaph's psalm and as the psalms as a whole move forward, we understand that life is not always like that. But as we transition in the middle of those thoughts, in the middle of those doubts, as we refocus our hearts and our minds uh, along with God's people towards God, we begin to understand that even though we don't understand everything that's going on, God is still in control. He is still good and worthy of our worship and praise. And this is not true just of the Psalter. This is not true just of this psalm. The same is true for the Bible as a whole. In a way, the psalms, and this psalm in particular for us this morning, it paints the picture of these pages for us on just a smaller account. Michael Wilcock points out that Psalm 73.1 reflect the first two chapters of Genesis. In the beginning, man was simply to obey and Eden it is theirs in all its perfection for all eternity. But we know things didn't end there, right? Adam and Eve fall into the trap, much like us off, the trap of, of envy, the trap of, of self, the trap that asks, is God really good? Wilcock writes this, A world distorted by sin needs reorientation before it has any hope of recovering what was lost. In fact, we can't recover what was lost. He continues on, he says, the way back to Eden is barred by a flaming sword. There is only the long, hard way forward. And that way, that way forward, what we see in the middle here of Psalm 73, what we see in the middle of the Psalter, what we see in the middle of Scripture, that long way forward. That way forward is marred by sin and disorientation. However, despite that, Asaf can conclude as he refocuses his, his mind on God with God's people, much like Scripture does, he can conclude, much like Scripture does in the last two chapters of Revelation, that God will receive us up to glory into paradise where he shall be our portion forever. The question then is how do we get there? How do we move from lack of obedience and the distortion and disorientation of sin how do we move from Eden lost to a place of trust, a place of grace and glory, a place of paradise? Notice where Asaf went in the middle of this psalm. Where did he go? He went into the sanctuary of the Lord. He met with God and everything changed. The story of, on the pages of Scripture tell us that in the middle of our sin and disorientation, even while we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love for us. And he did so by coming to meet us, right? He came to meet us in the form of a servant. 
in the form of Christ Jesus. The good news of Scripture is that we can draw near to God now because He first drew near to us. We moved from Eden to paradise through none other than God Himself in Christ Jesus and His work for us. Brothers and sisters, as as we consider these last few months, as we anticipate our coming together again as much as possible, let's understand the importance of our gathering together as the family of God in His presence. For those of you that have become disoriented in the midst of this loneliness brought about by the pandemic, understand that you have brothers and sisters in Christ that are willing and eager to help. But most importantly, draw near to God and trust in Him. It's for your good to draw near to Him, certainly. But it's for the good of others as well. For those that are disoriented uh, by, by loneliness and sin, whatever it may be, by doubts and questions, we need you. We need you. I need you. Your church family needs you. We need one another. So as we come back together... Let's come back together with this godly perspective concerning the world in which we live. This godly perspective that says, even though we don't understand everything, we see there in the middle of Scripture that God so loved us that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us that we might have life. With that godly perspective in our minds, as we come back together, let's, let's draw upon that. Let it, let it, let's let it control the way in which we live, the way in which we think, the way in which we disciple, uh, the way in which uh, we grow, the way in which we help one another, the way in which we love, and, and finally the way in which we go out and declare all of His good works uh, to this world. And let us pray. Father, we thank You for the words of Asaf here. As we see a man that struggled with doubts, and questions due to a, uh, a, self, a self-centered perspective. We fall into that so often, Father. And we ask that you would forgive us when we do. And help us to understand that we are not in this alone. You have given us an amazing gift in our brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to come together in your presence to help one another. To edify one another to encourage one another, to build one another up in love and good works. And help us all to turn our attention to you, to who you are, to what you have done for us in your Son, Christ. And Father, help that newfound godly perspective help us move it, move us from, from doubt to trust. Move us from complacency to mission. And Father, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.